Welcome everybody to a new exciting episode of Ask Your Doctors. My name is Dr. Benola Mashishi and uh, joining me today is Dr. K. Hi, Dr. K. Hi, Dr. Benola. How are you, how are you doing? Sharp, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Good, yeah, good. feeling relaxed, which is yep. good. That, that, that's, I'm more relaxed than you. Is it? I, yeah. I'm, I'm okay too. Because you're driving the ship today. Yes, I hope during the month of September it is a time for spring cleaning, getting our heads clear and continue with that same breath. We are focusing this month on mental health and joining us today is Dr. Samke Ngobo and she is going to be sharing her own journey about living with bipolar disorder and she's also written a book about this journey titled Reflections of a Convoluted Mind. Thank you, Dr. Sanke. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Um, so you coin your mental health journey, um, and it's quite an interesting journey. Uh, maybe you can share that with us. Um, you know, you know, where did this journey start, um, and how did you get to discover what you went through, and and what has it been like since then? Mm. You know, this journey started 21 years ago, 2001. I was 14 years old, and you know bright colorful childhood until life hit and hit quite early if you can think about it I was 14 years old so at the time I was displaying behavior that was abnormal for my parents to see so you know people just assume that teenagers can be moody so there's nothing out of the ordinary then but things kept progressing and uh, in them progressing I started hearing voices of deceased relatives I started speaking to people that aren't there I felt that the radio was speaking to me, the billboards were communicating with me. So I was basically in a psychotic state, just to simply put it. And my parents became worried then. So the moods went to, too worrying for them. But when I started communicating with the deceased, that's when it was a sign that you know something is not okay. And then that was my first encounter with mental health care services. And I was diagnosed with a mental illness, whereby they were scared to say, at the time what it was. So I, they told me that I have a mood disorder. What does that even mean to a 14 year old, you know? So I carried that with me that, you know, I have a diagnosis, but then life became a bit more stable after that. And I continued with my high schooling career with very little intervention after that. Um, it was then when, you know, university happened that <coughs> the bipolar said hello in the biggest way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that might have been scary. I can imagine, you know, going through um, adolescence and then you're experiencing this um, over and above the normal adolescent stage um, and then you're finding yourself into adulthood and then you know it, it's just increasing in intensity um, so that might have been scary I can imagine. No it absolutely was scary you know in between that time when I was first seen to be ill I was you know deemed to be demon possessed people didn't understand this is KwaZulu Natal, Durban, 2001. Not this conversation that we're having nowadays, you know, mm -hmm. about mental health, having a diagnosis. So people were scared of me. I was exorcised at the hospital when I was first admitted, you know, being made to shout the name of God, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I didn't understand. I was just complying with what I, what I was being told. Mm -hmm. Only to realize in hindsight that, no, they were casting something out that had come into me. Mm -hmm. So I've been through the exorcisms. I have been deemed to be bewitched. It's been quite a journey. Mm -hmm. And then when medical school began, it was fine and smooth until then the illness came and it was a very difficult time in my life difficult time, yes. if I may just interject mm -hmm. uh, you you had decided to study medicine despite everything as it didn't influence your decision that's a very interesting question to ask actually because my illness inspired me to be a doctor oh. I think I probably would be an artist or anything <laughs> else other than a doctor had I not been diagnosed you'd probably be richer now <laughs> 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 Absolutely. <laughs> I'd probably be singing somewhere, you know, and making hits, but my illness inspired me to study medicine. I was so curious. People were not wanting to say what's happening to me, and I knew that issues of the mind uh, were related to, you know, being a psychologist or being a psychiatrist. So in high school, you know, when you're choosing careers, you mm -hmm. don't know which path you're going to take. Mm -hmm. I knew that it had to do with the mind because I wanted to understand what is happening to me. So I think medicine chose me mm -hmm. more than me choosing it. Choosing it. It was a calling. Definitely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the aims of today's show is really to, um, you know, address stigma and destigmatize mental health illness. And certainly some of the things that you are talking about, you know, being uh, labeled as bewitched and stuff, 
you know, forms part of all the stigma. Um, and it would help, obviously, if you come from a strong support system while going through this journey. And how was that for you? That's an incredible um, way of looking at it because had it not been for my support structure, I don't think I'd be where I am today and living a functional, holistic, full life that I'm living. The early intervention was critical in my well-being, you know. So one of the things that was so difficult related to the stigma is that it's isolating. It makes you feel... Uh, rejected, it makes you feel ostracized. And at that time, it was very intense at the time. People did not want to drink from the same cup I was drinking from because they sure. felt that what I had was contagious. Mm. So there was cultural stigma, social stigma, religious stigma, all forms of stigma wrapped up and being targeted at a 14 year old. Mm. So my family, my parents were very proactive in that regard because from the onset, they knew to pursue the medical support that was necessary for my quality of life to be what it is today. Mm. And that's amazing, yeah. Can I say something controversial about our beliefs? Is that you may get intervention. Eventually you may be, you may feel better. But the problem is with people that stigmatize because of their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Recover from their beliefs that mislead them. Mm -hmm. Because their thoughts of you were influenced by crooked beliefs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, it's, it's something that strikes me because sometimes on the platform we talk about uh, uh, sexual orientation, we talk about people that are uh, transgender, uh, then, but you find that we make decisions about what we want to do with our lives. The people that judge us harshly, so might I add, don't recover from how they look at life. Absolutely, I and completely agree. I don't know how, what we can do to help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment, I, I don't know. It is, when you're fixed in your beliefs, um, there's very little one can change. But I think taking the holistic picture of a person, mm -hmm. embracing what they believe, but also introducing the, the, the educational knowledge will be helpful because expecting people to dismiss what they believe is, you know, I think it's a futile thing and it feels patronizing to people as well. So I think it's just to bring the world together and see how they can work you know, synergistically, so to speak, because that's the only way you can win people over, because to expect people to reject their belief systems um, is something that, um, is, you know, will not be advancing as well. And I guess that's what makes your story so phenomenal, is that not only do you share your journey about, you know, when it started, how you've overcome, but you've also invested in um, educating people, trying to um, bring perspective to, to mental health uh, illnesses and, and the stigma. Um, and if I may ask, how has that shifted? I mean, from 14 years old, you're dealing with a lot of stigma, people are not aware, and now you, you, you're kind of shaping the way people think. How has that shifted? You know, I wanted to, you know, the way mentally ill people were being portrayed was not resonating with me. I saw myself as a full person with a full life and how television shows a mentally ill person, how society sees a person, unfortunately even in 2022, still believed to be somebody that's running around naked on the streets speaking to themselves and that's what they see a mentally ill person to be. So I did not ever think I'd be speaking publicly at the level that I am to be, I must confess. Um, this began two years ago to speak as openly as I am because I'd been, I had reached my, my boiling point in this and how the journey had become for me. So I just took a responsibility. I felt that as a doctor, people might take it more seriously to hear somebody who lives this journey, but has the medical knowledge as well to back up what they're saying. I just felt a responsibility to be an activist um, in this part and an advocate. And I believe that there's no better advocacy than self-advocacy. And I felt that representing this journey on my own would be that as a mentally ill person. I certainly never thought that I would be speaking as publicly as I am and openly as I'm sharing. And as you asked about my life as a 14 year old versus where I am now, I think I reached boiling point about two years ago when I thought, you know, unless I take a proactive stance on my own and not wait for somebody else, mm -hmm. then there won't be any change because I believe that the best advocacy is self-advocacy and mm -hmm. self-activism because mm -hmm. speaking in our own voice as people who live with mental illness, and the lived experience is a powerful part because we can represent ourselves as best as we can, more than somebody speaking at us. So being a 14 year old, I had no voice at the time. The big people were saying what they were saying, they were seeing me the way they were seeing me. But 
I just felt that it could be a very impactful change to be a doctor who brings the medical knowledge of this journey, having worked in mental health care services, and then bring the experience of being a mentally ill person, because how we are portrayed plays a very big role in breaking the stigma. Mm. 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 I love that, I love that. Um, and thank you for sharing your journey. I think it's um, courageous um, that you, you, know, you decided, you know, I'm gonna speak and, and have a voice for people who may not have a voice for themselves, um, including the 14-year-old uh, Dr. Ngobo Osamke at that mm. time. Yeah, so that, that's really, thank you for that. No, that's quite an analogy to have that I'm speaking for her in some way, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and if I may ask, how um, has that shaped the way you interact with your patients in clinical practice? Are you still practicing clinical medicine or are you focused solely on, um, you know, dealing with mental health care users and individuals who have... Mm. So I've worked in mental health care services for about five years. I am in corporate, the corporate space in wellness currently, but I was working as a, a registrar and as a medical officer in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it was a very powerful thing for me because I have the experience of being on both sides of the consulting room. And that's an advantage actually, mm -hmm. because I, sit with, I would sit with patients living with mental illness and I would understand what they're speaking from in a contextualized manner, not just seeing them as just people who come and collect medication and they go home. But I know that there's a deeper story and a, a, a greater impact around and many influences that affect them. And then as a doctor as well, you know, I know the kind of empathy and care that they would require. And obviously I had a, a bias, so to speak, because <laughs> I understand and that you know, feeling understood in any space is very important. So for me to come as a doctor who knows the journey um, has been something that's been very empowering for me. And also, you know, knowing the rights of people uh, with mental illnesses has also been helpful in how I navigated that journey. Mm -hmm. um, and let's speak about the time then you took um, a leave period for, for half the year, you know. <laughs> how did that come about and what did you have to deal with, yeah. You know, if only that was a sabbatical, it was nothing close to being a sabbatical. Um, I was placed on incapacity leave. Mm. And the events leading up to that, I'd had a major relapse, one of the worst ones yet, because I've had frequent relapses, several admissions uh, in my life since the age of 14. What made this one different was that it was a public one, witnessed by colleagues, witnessed by uh, friends, witnessed by people I don't know, um, social media platform, um, and I was just leaving voice notes till kingdom come, basically. So that led to me having an involuntary admission uh, because I was, I was uncontainable, I was a danger to myself, danger to other people, and I was placed in a state facility, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, I say unfortunately because it was that particular one that was also quite um, a challenge, not to say all state facilities are quite terrible, not to say that at all. So when I came back to see my psychiatrist, my, my normal psychiatrist, um, she booked me off for three weeks following that admission. And I could sense that I'm not 100, 100%. I was still quite dazed and I thought it's just because I was admitted to hospital, still recovering. So I came back and she says, I'm, yeah, I need to book you off for longer. I'm like, yeah, I think I need another week. And she says, no, I need to put you on incapacity leave. And I thought, what does that even mean for me? Mm. Because if you're a doctor, a whole load of your life is related to your work. Mm. Your life works around being a doctor mm. and mm. everything else, you know, attending things and everything else works around that. And she says, I'm booking off on an incapacity leave for six months because your brain functioning has been impacted by the severity of your relapse. And formal forms, 20 pages, HR, you know, wow. I didn't realize how many forms there are to actually get this, um, you know, official, official. So there's a very formal thing where I was placed on incapacity leave so that I could recuperate and recover, rehabilitate and get back to my baseline level of functioning. So that six months was grueling because it came, it was announced two weeks before the lockdown. It was 2020. I thought I'll be going to Walter Sisulu on, on Wednesdays just to unwind and de-stress. And I found myself on lockdown at home, not being a frontliner at all mm. because I had to look after myself during that time. So it was a very difficult time, but one that was life-changing in a positive way. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I think 
Yeah, it, you're right in saying that a lot of what we do as medical professionals is related to our work. And, you know, this shock that one would get, you know, six months and it's like, what do I do with myself, you know? And then you're facing a lockdown. It's like, I need the rehabilitation, which sometimes requires one to be outside yes. of that space. And it, it, yeah, it could be quite challenging. Yes, I yeah. so wish that I had, it was a booked holiday and I was just <laughs> I globe trotting, but it was nothing like yeah, that. Yeah. But then it inspired the book. Yes. And tell us more, speaking of which, it is uh, this one here. Yes. Yeah. So I decided to use my time effectively while I was, I was on capacity leave. And I had been, I thought I'd write a book at the age of 40, 45, because I thought I'd have something that matters to say by then. Yeah. It certainly wasn't a plan to come anytime soon. So during the time I was on incapacity leave, I just thought, let me use this time to document my story. I wanted people who live with mental illnesses to be heard, understood from our perspective. There was a lot of violation of my rights, I believe, during the admission I had had. And I just thought that if I never returned to the profession again, I wanted to have something documented that shares my story and my words where I could be heard. So Reflections on, of a Convoluted Mind was born a journey with my mental illness. So reflections, you know, how does a convoluted mind reflect? How does the mind of somebody living with a mental illness get to a point of reflecting it? Because it goes against the stigma. So I felt that I'm bringing a rational mind, a rational perspective of a lived, the lived experience of having a mental illness. So this is my pride and joy. Yeah, I can tell from your face, it's just <laughs> glowing. <laughs> so without spoiling it, Doc, uh, can you, just relate to us the most difficult, maybe the same as as well as the most, it could be one chapter, uh, as well as the most impactful chapter. Like I say, it could be one, it could be one chapter. Mm. I'll yeah. share one spoiler with you. Okay. <laughs> um, the most difficult and the most impactful chapter, mm. I'd rather, um, is the chapter where I speak about depression. It was difficult because I, I dug deep, I wanted to be truthful, so that mm. people who live with this must feel that they are understood. So I knew that I can't just write something superficially to protect my own ego and be seen a certain way. So having to speak about the journey and share about that was triggering quite in a major way, but um, it was also cathartic as well. So there's a part at the back of the book that's um, a part of the depression chapter where I speak about um, suicidal ideations and you know and the difficulty of being able to get out of bed and I read this part where I say I felt tightly tied to my bed by invisible ropes composed of demotivation and unfounded insurmountable exhaustion I find it I found it impossible to walk and reach the knob of my bedroom door which was a mere two meters away bathing was too high a demand and expectation an impossible goal to accomplish so I resided myself to lie in bed and not bath for successive days on end, disabled by feelings of defeat and failure due to the inability to achieve simple tasks. So writing those words, it took me back to those days. It, took, it brought back those feelings of being unable to get out of bed, you know, the struggle of facing the day that is scheduled. And I had to be truthful, but it was hard to be that vulnerable because once the book is out, it's out, and people know that, oh, success of days on end, when was this glamorous doctor ever not bathing? You know, that kind of a thing. So it was important, though. Let me put a light aside to it. It's more like a very terrible babalas, <laughs> except you didn't inflict it on yourself, <laughs> because that's what happens. And, and you hear on social media people saying, I'll never drink again. Okay, they'll do it again, but it is a terrible, terrible, terrible feeling. Absolutely. Except you didn't inflict it on yourself. Mm. Mm. Lovely time. way of yeah. looking at it. Yeah, I'm mean, trying to put a light spin mm. on it. But people that drink know. That's why they will come out guilty saying, I will never drink again. Mm. And mm. it's a terrible, terrible feeling. I know what you mean. Yeah. Don't jump to any conclusions about me. No, no, no. No <laughs> judgment. Okay. This is a safe space, right? <laughs> yes, okay. it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah, it's a safe space, so no judgment here. Yeah, that little paragraph uh, describes it's a very terrible feeling. Yeah. Mm. It's not being functional and yeah mm. in any case um we would like to ask you about lessons um, 
that you, when writing the book, uh, that you now grasped and now, now, now that you would like to project out there? Mm. I, one of the lessons I, I, I gained was that there's power in being truthful, there's power in vulnerability. I made sure that in writing my story that it's not something that leaves people depleted of hope, triggered as anything and then there's nothing to do. I made sure that I speak truthfully in a manner that empowers the reader, that informs the reader and gives a sense of hope. I just see that there's community in sharing our lived experience and I see it through how people are reaching out to me and how people resonate with my story. And that's when I see that I really did do something right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm gonna ask you later, what mitigates the condition for it to be you know, a bit better and what aggravates it? And, uh, but let's talk about stigma. How do you think we can overcome stigma? I think conversations like the one we're having today uh, is very, are very important more and more needs to be done in terms of speaking about the shame that exists, speaking about the discrimination, you know, making people realize that certain ways of doing things are no longer relevant nowadays. There are so many approaches and ways of supporting somebody other than just victimizing them because you don't understand. And I believe that for people to be stigmatized is because there's a fear response from the person who is subjecting the person struggling with stigma. So, there's the part of supporting the person living with the mental illness, then there's an important part of educating people who are still subjecting people who have the struggle. Let's talk about... I, I sorry, just wanted you to first. interject here yeah. a little bit. Um, you know, and, and people think stigma is the radical stuff, you know, the major stuff. And sometimes it's quite subtle. You know, it, it's, it's systemic, it's individualized, um, and people might not be aware that they're actually portraying stigma to, to people. It's almost like how we deal with other societal uh, issues, racism, sexism, you know, um, and, and stigma is also quite subtle like that. So I, I think, yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. It's not that overt where necessarily you, you might not be exorcising someone mm. to then say mm. uh, you are subjecting them or not drink from the same cup as they are. But if you're saying you don't look depressed, you don't look bipolar, yeah. that's a stigma on mm. its own. So yeah. you're very correct in saying You look that. normal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I agree that there's a thing in, in, in life that uh, you consider other people abnormal and others normal. Yeah, yes. so, so you, you're, you're one of us, you're like me, you know, as if I am normal, okay. you know. Yeah, and it's all convoluted as reflected yes, in absolutely, the book. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, well, pharmaceutically and non-pharmaceutically, what makes it better? You know, I think it's a holistic picture. Um, you know, the pharmacology is critical, and I always speak about a holistic, multidisciplinary approach. And within the discipline of psychiatry and psychology, we speak of a multidisciplinary team approach. So it's not, oh, I'm going to take medication. I'm not, I'm just going mm. or to say, I'm just going to take medication and nothing else. Or to say, I'm just going to do yoga and that's it. Mm. It's a holistic approach because we are multifaceted beings, multidimensional. So you don't just look at one area. Pharmacology is so important because in having an imbalance of chemicals in your body, you require something to support that. And like other conditions, diabetes, hypertension, HIV, you may still pray. There's no dismissing the prayer element, but there's also the importance of taking your antiretrovirals. And mm. I, the same applies with the mental illness, but somehow it gets seen differently for some reason. So now, Doc, we, we want to debunk some myths, get some tips from you. I don't know which you want to start with. Let's debunk the myths. Okay, let's debunk the myths. Yeah. I would like to start. Okay. That everybody is crazy. That if you struggle with a mental illness, you are crazy. Certainly. Like, as Dr. Samge said, initially we, we have this image of is the person on the side of the street who's homeless, who's not um, looking a certain way, behaving abnormally, um, and that carries out through the whole spectrum of mental illness. Mm -hmm. It's a myth that, you know, a, a mental illness is related to poverty. There are people who are high functioning and still have a mental illness. 
There are people who wear their suit, wear their beautiful dresses, but are struggling with mental health issues. So it's a myth to say that it goes by socioeconomic factors. It definitely is not. It does not know race. It does not know class. It definitely does not know. It's not an illness that is not for people who are affluent. It affects everybody. So it's a mm. myth to think that it's related to socioeconomic factors. Okay. Is there anything positive that may emanate? You know, there are some people say geniuses are, have that, you know? <laughs> Beautiful mind. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'd like to say that about myself. Um, mm. You know, not realizing when, when my condition wasn't 100% contained, I would do the all-nighters. I mean, as a medical student, all-nighters help. Mm. So, and not be tired. You know, with, with having bipolar disorder, you have the goal-directed activity, you have the increased thought speed as well. Obviously, when, when the functionality is going down, then you're not going to be effective. Mm. But I can definitely look at the all-nighters I used to put off and not be tired to go to lectures. That was helpful. Mm. So and creativity. The creativity and the genius element, I think it's there, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, being a virologist and everything, just throw the COVID issue into the mix. Um, a lot of the, like during COVID uh, lockdowns, we saw uh, an epidemic rise in, in mental illness. What are the tips really for somebody who may have been triggered during that time or still experiencing that they don't really have access to, to, to uh, mental health care? Um, what what can they do? Mm. You're very correct in saying that COVID brought up a lot related to mental health. People with pre-existing mental health conditions found themselves to have them exacerbated. Then there's people who've never had a diagnosis who now have a diagnosis of mental um, illness. And the tips I have is to make use of um, the resources that are made available, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, Lifeline, those resources are free and accessible, but some people don't know about them. Mm. Then there's tips of just having self-awareness to you know, not get to a point of a crisis. Because oftentimes, things related to mental health care services or mental health is when there's a trauma that's taken place, a disaster that's taken place, and then there's that need for urgent counseling and therapy. But self-care is part of our well-being. Exercise is important. Eating well is important. Being aware of our triggers, things that compromise our mental health is, impor is important to be aware of. And journaling, things like that, without sounding too airy-fairy, mm -hmm. but these things are important mm -hmm. in supporting our mental well-being. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you for those tips. Um, and we'd sure like to, you know, how do people get your copy of your book? Actually? So my book, um, you can get it on Amazon.com. Okay. Take a lot. Okay. You can get it on your Kindle. Um, there's bookshops. There's Book Circle Capital that has it. And online on VocalMentality.com. It's going to be available on my online shop on my website soon. Okay. okay. Awesome. awesome. And uh, how else do our followers follow you? So I have an Instagram page. Um, it's at underscore Vocal Mentality. So it's focused on my journey and mental illness, mental health as well. Then there's um, uh, my website, vocalmentality.com, where everything I do is in that one-stop space where every conversation, including this one, is going to be uploaded. Thank and, you. Um, so that's how, vocalmentality.com and at underscore vocalmentality. Are you practicing outside of your um, you know, corporate wellness programs and do, do you... Do you have that option? Mm. At this point in time, I'm fully in the corporate space with vocal mentality. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I give a lot of psychoeducational talks uh, in various organizations. I love mental health advocacy. I go to churches as well when I can. Okay. Teenage, spe um, so speaking engagements, I use them as a channel to reach people related to mental health okay. as well. Okay. No, that's, that's awesome. Okay. Okay, and they will also find you on our website, which is askyourdoctors.co.za. When you go to the menu, please click the button that says find a doctor. That's where you'll find all the specialists, friends of the show, and all the guests that have been on the show before. While you are there, please, when you go to YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe and share and like. Uh, Yes, and we'd love to hear from you guys. If you have any questions for Dr. Simke um, or any other questions that you'd like to be answered on the show, please feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. You can send a DM on Instagram, Facebook, send an email, um, always available. 
Um, and if you'd like to collaborate with the show, um, you are more than welcome to drop us a message, send an email at askyourdoctors.ca.za, and we look forward to hearing from you. Including brands that would like to advertise on our platforms. And uh, Doc, it's been a blast. Thank you. Uh, this mental health episode, I think some of the crew members are afraid of discussing <laughs> mental health because it says it just leaves you so overwhelmed, you know. But this was a lovely one. Thank yeah. you.